Real quick, I'm not talking at all about how these films are loose adaptations of scattered fragments of the comic books that came before, which is not new for my show, but it is especially important in this case, as having read the source material in the Marvel Universe cannot matter from a business perspective unless you are allergic to the idea of making money. It is not possible to make something on this scale and have any belief that the audience will be familiar with literally any of it. You have to believe that every movie is their first movie. That's how Marvel wins almost every time. The two lowest grossing movies of this iteration of the Marvel Cinematic Universe are The Incredible Hulk and Ant-Man. Hi, I'm Scott. They mean less and they made less. When they mean more, they make more. And different directors and writers use the comics for inspiration for a lot of things, but they combine characters and pick and choose traits from old books to deliver their story within the restriction of the universe. It is surprising the caliber of talent these films seem to attract. Famous people like having fun too. Travel back with me to the past. It was a year known as 2014. I remember in that year there were Sony rumblings of a Robin Hood shared universe and I remember distinctly having the feeling that, uh oh, we broke it. Sony also had a Spider-Man shared universe cooking where the Sinister Six were going to get their own movies, a plan that apparently they're still trying to do because reasons. Have you learned nothing, Tom? The Amazing Spider-Man is a microcosm of that problem. It's trying to create a shared universe out of a subset of a larger and encompassing shared universe. I.e. Spider-Man wasn't in the MCU at the time, so they'll just make Spider-Man its own MCU. They kind of forgot to make films, not Sony advertisements, canceling the plans for a universe that would have allowed for a Sinister Six movie, and I'll just point to the Suicide Squad movie and say you broke your villains in the same motion that you failed to make them heroes. Please don't touch me. Please don't touch me. The meat on the dramatic bones matters. Like Loki could be in a villain team up movie because he's, as Avril Lavigne would say, let me come at the universe thing in a weird way. Deadpool and Logan are two individual films that worked, but it's kind of impossible to put Deadpool and Logan into the same movie and have that tonally fit both characters simultaneously. And that's the rub. Marvel designs ideas that work on their own and then combine into larger and larger things. Like a quilt they're all making together. I'm not really even going to talk about the action set pieces in these action movies. More so, I want to talk about all the boring melodramatic bits in between all the action. The subtext and the, you think I'm joking but give me a minute, nuance. And I'm really going to lean on that quilt metaphor. How do you make a shared universe? It's a marvel anyone has. Don't get it twisted, the point of this concept is for Marvel to make townhouses full of money. This is for-profit comic pop art. A bunch of super smart people getting together to make the most outlandish thing possible together. It's a team effort and therein lies the success. Each artist has to build on previous artists' work. But if we're gonna make our quilt like this, first we have to ask ourselves about the scale of how big we wanna make it. Marvel decided the answer to how big they were shooting for was, How dare you deign to speak to a god. One, know the scale of what you can make out of the materials you have access to. This one's important. Alien vs. Predator and Freddy vs. Jason are existing shared universes that found some success by combining a couple of characters. They are scaled small because that's what those franchises can handle. No one saves or threatens the world, they both threaten small groups of people in entirely remote locations. Second thing, set your stakes to match the scale from point one. 
i.e. don't start with Spider-Man surfing inside of a robotic pinwheel in lower Earth orbit. Start with like Iron Man, Hulk, Captain America, Thor, little stories. Hey, here's a funny sentence. Marvel hired Kenneth Branagh to make a film about superhero Norse mythology, and in the grand scheme of things, he made the most subdued film out of all of them. Get to know the characters, deepen them over time, learn from your mistakes, get better. Conversely, don't try to sell us on monumental conflicts if you've deprived us of relatable human struggles to anchor us to the people of the world. Which takes like 10 years, apparently. Marvel started building to get to a scale of six. Something at the time no one had ever done. I mean, six superheroes in one movie? What fools we were! It was a milestone. This shot was historical, though adorable in hindsight. Now it's all... The Dark Universe didn't work for, yeah, let's say, all reasons. But making a villain's shared universe seemingly without considering that six movies about villains is unrelentingly hard because good luck making us relate to them without ruining the original film they came from. Maleficent barely kind of did this once, and I'm sure there was someone at Disney that wanted a Disney villain's shared universe where Maleficent teamed up with Ursula, Shere Khan, and Cruella de Vil. Ha, note to self. That, that sounds pre pretty cool, actually. Third bomb. Anchor us to the people. What hurts me, wounds me is that my good friend Lindsay isn't going to get her dark universe Ansel Elgort Hunchback of Notre Dame film. And some mistakes I just can't forgive. Like Robin Hood, they just greenlit a big thing without doing the due diligence of the universe to see that not everything is going to scale like the back catalog of, you know, Marvel, i.e. I really want to see the Merry Men film where we explore the characters as individuals without all that pesky IP defining merriment, Robin the Rich and teamwork and shit. Have a plan that fits your universe, not just a menu. Okay, we got an idea of how big we want to make this quilt, and like Marvel, huge. And now I want to talk about the individual films, but also sort of as a design, as a large plan. Like, how do they stitch all this stuff together? Well, I'll tell you. I'm gonna give you the recipe for a single Marvel film and we'll begin stitching our shared universe quilt together from there. This is my favorite part because we're gonna recognize how ridiculous this is. Ready? Rule one, begin with a premise that is literally impossible, like super soldiers who got frozen in the ice for like 69 nice. years, or sarcastic space raccoons, or texting and driving Dumbledores, or rule two, whenever you can, do the most absolutely impossible, ridiculous thing you can, always. Rule three. Okay, now ask with a straight face, how would somebody react to this? Example, a super serum that seemingly manufactures matter out of thin air, creating a super soldier out of little Stevie 90 pounds who is wah wah frozen for almost 70 years, who's best friends with a dude who seemingly dies on a pretty conclusively life ending fall, but is actually apprehended and turned into a reprogrammed super soldier with a jacks arm. <laughs> who was incidentally also frozen in time, but was brainwashed into a mindless killer drone by a manufactured and cartoonishly evil factory. The likeliness of that happening are, as we are taught in school, 270 duodecillion to one. I rounded down. That's all played with the straightest face. Steve, a person who is committed to dying for a worthy cause, goes down with the ship not once, but twice, he's such a loyal friend that he breaks through a cartoonishly evil organization's deprogramming of Bucky. With his loyalty. They're all like that. They switch genres and deepen characters practically every time to the point they actually start to feel like relatable people who are, mathematically speaking, the least relatable person on the planet because their entire life is impossible. We definitely take this for granted the number of times, not all the time, but the number of times this has given us genuinely worth watching films. Agility plays a big part. Big studios wouldn't have made Thor Ragnarok and Black Panther back to back two of their best films. 
Novig reboot one of their major franchises while making a film unlike anything else. No risk there, and it all still fits the brand. The agility matters. They're letting the artists speak. The Russo brothers, Ryan Coogler, James Gunn, Anna Bowden, Ryan Fleck, Joe Johnson, Kenneth Branagh, Taika Waititi, Jon Favreau, Shane Black. They're getting better while simultaneously expanding the universe ever and ever outward. They make us care. Black Panther is the biggest superhero on the planet right now. I'm into the Marvel playbook because, yeah, it's easy to be cynical about superhero movies right now, but they're still crushing it. Ten years into this experiment, they're making their best stuff. That's remarkable. They are making decisions beyond anyone in their field, and I am recognizing the collective work for that reason. They succeed by being agile, much more than the typical studio would be. Kevin Feige has been there since day one. Dude was an associate producer on Blade and X-Men. Now he heads up literally one of the biggest studios in the world. And he does it by letting the artists speak through their characters. If they keep doing that, the success will continue. Holding this quilt together are the characters and the artists. And I want to talk about just one of those characters for a minute. I'm gonna do this all day. Steve Rogers has the average luck of a character in a Lifetime original movie. He sinks his teeth into pathos like a vampire on speed and he's one of the best things that Marvel has to offer. His arc is sweeping. He joins the army as an idealistic young man wanting to do the right thing. He starts in a binary world of good and evil and fights so many battles over so many films. And I realize I haven't said this yet in the episode. I understand this is based on a lot of comic storylines and other things, but it's the way they pick and choose the jumping off points and then hand that to the artists that I find life affirming. By the time Civil War rolls around, he's embraced the finer tenets of nihilism and he finds himself in a situation where he questions the very nature of good and evil because he has to wallow in the gradations of it, like accidentally killing people, and Steve has precious few people left, fewer by the day. Time robbed him of the life he earned, now he is a man consumed by his pathos. He is driven to do the right thing because the plot creates a hero that lives to serve because he'd lay down and cry himself to dead if he didn't have people to save. Steve is never not sad, ever. That's the level you gotta work a shared universe at. That's why Marvel is the bar. They think about this stuff. I'll admit imperfectly, but before you tut tut me with all the stuff they're getting wrong, they're getting a lot of stuff very right. They find themselves mattering in powerful ways more than they don't. Exciting things. Important things from perspectives that offer insight into the nuances of, of some of history's greater injustices. While still being a super fun Marvel superhero film, Ryan Coogler made a nuanced portrait of the ramifications of reckless, unjust imperialism while simultaneously competing in the Marvel Kentucky f Derby where the horses are armed with swords and have exoskeletons. Like, how did you do both things? I can't imagine anyone succeeding at a higher level than Ryan Coogler managed to do. It's a phenomenal achievement and a film that stands exceptionally tall and it still toes the Marvel line and does all that crossover stuff. Creed was an exceptional rebooting of the Rocky canon, but Black Panther is an actual cultural moment. And unlike Creed, it's actually getting rewarded for that. Ryan Coogler can make literally anything he wants now. He could reboot Xanadu right now, and I'd be all about it. Ryan, don't listen to me, but do it. Marvel built an absolutely mammoth tapestry, each artist adding to it and deepening this neon fantasy indulgence with their pop art contributions. That's it. They didn't get in the way. They struggled at first, and then they learned to trust the artists. 
That's it. That's the secret of making a shared universe. Set up your goalposts and point artists you trust at them. And it is something that no studio has seemed to be able to duplicate and lots and lots have tried. I think we take a little for granted that so many filmmakers were able to contribute to a thing and the thing is now so unreasonably large in scope as a result of them basically playing Katamari Damashi with each other. And I know there's very few places left to go, but this is a fun ride, so who really cares? We've been saying the gas is about to run out of that tank any second now for like years. The last two things they did were Thor Ragnarok and Black Panther. Any questions? I'm just along for the ride now. But did you know? The two people that made Half Nelson are making Captain Marvel. Huh, that's a hell of an angle. Trust the artists to make art, even if it's pop art, because that still matters and has something to say. That's kind of the great thing about quilts. They keep you warm. Hey everybody, we did it, we're alive. Just like Alex Podgorski. That's what I'm always saying about him. That boy's alive. Uh, or girl, or whatever you choose. I'm, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Hello Patreon and everyone. These are all the, the high tier Patreon people. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, please go to patreon.com slash movies of Mikey. That funds all the great stuff you see on FilmJoy, so please go check that out. Like and subscribe to this channel, like this video. Just like I like Mark Lux and Sam G and TPR Jones and Jess Johnson and William Dixon and Lord Hask and Andrew Hackard, especially Andrew Hackard. I just think about Andrew Hackard all the time. And Ben Patton, but I do think about Ben Patton all the time. Uh, next episode is going to be Thor Ragnarok. I'm very excited. Uh, it's about specifically how they rebooted it and how they built that into the new Marvel canon. Uh, just like Amy B, she's the next Marvel superhero. Doesn't even make any sense. What's up, Adam Muto? Hey, everybody. Uh, here's a, here's the thing you could do to really help us out. This is not a joke. I know you hear this all the time uh, on every channel to smash that subscribe button and ring that bell. Uh, 2018 is a very interesting thing. You need to ring that bell. That'll that that really helps. Um, been getting word from a lot of a lot of people that watch this show that they're not being told when it's up anymore and that sucks so not kidding i mean i'm just talking over a bunch of names like german sadu jack anthony payton carlin kendrick charles barker just m minimize like out of ab what is the word whatever where you unmaximize the video just click click that bell just do it click it click that bell right now at Aaron DeBerry did. I can't confirm that, but he might have. Um, yeah, so uh, this is really fun going every two weeks. This is this is really hard. Thank you to all these incredibly patient uh, patrons you have scrolling by here. Again, patreon.com slash movies and Mikey if you would like to contribute and possibly have your name up here. And then I'll make jokes about your name, Patrick Mahoney. Yeah, yeah, Patrick. Worth the price of admission, right there. Because I said it. Uh, no, thank you all so much. Uh, this is so much fun. I love making this show. Every two weeks is kicking my ass a little bit, but I think the show is actually kind of better when my ass gets kicked. So why not? Let's see. Let's see how this goes. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Smash that sub, ring that bell, and. Tweet things at me at Mikey Face. Be like, hey, bud. Oh, I'm out of time. Sorry, bye. Perfect lane.